When the Third Reich toppled Europe in 1940, the United States emerged from its isolation and prepared for war. From having a few hundred tanks in 1939, America's vast car industry became a tank production line overnight. When the US joined the Allies in 1941, it brought a tank that went on to become one of the most prolific and successful of the war. Known as the Lee by the Americans and the Grant by the British. It was America's answer. For some years after the First World War, the men leading the US Army firmly believed that the tank's only purpose was to support the infantry. This strong belief eventually became the 1920 National Defense Act, under which the existing tank corps was split up and placed under the command of the Chief of Infantry. At the same time, the cavalry started a program of mechanization and to avoid opposing the act, it was forced to refer to the tanks it bought as combat cars. Any piece of equipment develops according to experience. And the experience that the Americans took back from the First World War was that tanks were purely for supporting infantry. So all their efforts and all their thinking go into the tank as an infantry support weapon. They carry that to its... I suppose logical, although I prefer to say illogical conclusion, in that they disband the tank corps altogether. Well, that's part of a broader American military tradition of, you know, raising armies to fight in wartime and then having them demobilise very rapidly at the end of the war. And you would see that at the end of the American Civil War and precisely the same thing happens at the end of the, the Great War. The Americans could not envisage taking part in another major European war. They could only envisage uh, perhaps a border war with Mexico or um, some kind of um, warfare in the Pacific, um, in the Philippines. So really all they wanted were um, infantry support vehicles. But even in the 30s, they are still thinking in terms of the tank as an infantry support weapon and not as anything else. Many middle-ranking army officers, including George Patton and Dwight Eisenhower, believed that the tank had other uses besides supporting the infantry. But their ideas were far too radical for the US Army, so Patton and Eisenhower had to keep their views to themselves or risk damaging their careers. At that particular time, there was a theory taken quite seriously by the Russians and the French and especially the Italians, that an infantry tank assault would be led by medium tanks in the first wave. And the second wave could, would consist of a swarm, if you like, of light tanks. Uh, and the United States Army tended to concentrate on this. The Secretary of War in 1927 goes to actually visit the United Kingdom and sees some of the early British tank manoeuvres and comes back and says, gosh, we ought to do something. And people like Serino Brett and, and of course, uh, also Douglas MacArthur are well aware of the kind of limitations of the American military. MacArthur becomes Chief of Staff in 1931 and serves until 1936. But again, he's very much constrained by the kind of budgetary constraints that America's under. And remember, this is also the Depression. You know, there's lots of, of pressure on public expenditure. And the army, and within that armour, is very much near the bottom of the pile. As America wrestled with the Great Depression during the 1920s and 30s, defence spending was drastically reduced 
Although exercises were held to look at the tactical effects of mechanization, the troops involved were dispersed afterwards. By 1940, the US had fewer than 400 tanks, the majority of which were light tanks left over from the First World War. And the reason that most American tanks were very light was so that they could be carried by American railways and so they could get across all American bridges. And if they took it abroad, so it could get across American engineer bridging equipment, which could carry about 15 tons. This started to change with the Spanish Civil War. Um, the Americans examined the Spanish Civil War and began to realize that um, the light tanks that they'd, they'd concentrated on and were really um, machine gun armed and, and not really suitable for modern warfare. So they began to think about uh, a gun armed tank. They still had to have a weight limit, they still had to have a fairly small tank, but a gun armed tank nonetheless. And these started to emerge um, in the late 1930s. But in 1940, events forced the US Army to completely change its tank policy. The German blitzkrieg against Poland and France showed the world that tanks were not only lethal in an infantry support role, but could stun opposing forces into submission when used in formation. 1940 is, is a real sea change for the Americans because nobody had expected France to fall in a matter of six weeks. France was regarded as being one of the great powers. And for France to fall so rapidly to the Germans was really an astonishing victory. And the Americans were deeply shocked by that. It preempted a whole raft of measures, including a big increase in the defence budget, uh, a mobilisation of reserves, and a kind of uh, sense of national concern that America may not get involved in this war in Europe, but America needed to be prepared. In reaction to this turn of events, the M2 tank was put into immediate production. The chassis, engine and suspension of the M2 provided the basis for the M3 and M4 tanks that followed. The M2 had a six-man crew. It mounted a 37mm M6 gun as well as eight Browning machine guns. Its armour was up to 32mm thick. Its right supercharged engine could reach a range of 130 miles, a brake horsepower of 400 and a top road speed of 26 miles per hour. It was a reliable machine, bristled with machine guns, some of which pointed backwards, a very dangerous practice, but nevertheless. Um, and it ran on a, a very robust suspension, had a very big hull, it was suitable for mass production. In fact, it didn't go into mass production um, because after the German invasion of Poland and later France, uh, it was clearly outclassed. The M2 was important in that it was a very useful stopgap for training, and that's all it was for. It never got as far as the battlefield. It was, it was undergunned, it was under-armoured, but at least it got people thinking along the right lines, and at least it allowed them to train with some sort of armour. By 1940, it was obvious that American tanks would need a 75mm gun in a traversing turret to even stand a chance of taking on the Panzers III and IV. Although a tank was being developed that would solve this problem, it would be some time before it was ready for mass production. So the US Army had little choice but to produce a tank based on the M2. Because it was impossible to mount a 75mm gun in the M2's small top turret, the turret was moved to a position over the left sponson and a commander's coupler was added. The right sponson was then enlarged to accommodate a 75mm gun with limited traverse. Named after the Confederate General Robert E. Lee, the M3 had a seven-man crew. In addition to its 75mm gun, the M3 also mounted a 37mm gun as well as four machine guns. Its armour was up to 37mm thick. Its right radial engine gave it a 340 brake horsepower, a range of 120 miles, and a top road speed of 26 miles per hour. 
in many respects, the, the, the Lee tank came into being to make use of, of, of existing facilities and to make use of, of existing components. Um, it was an adaptation of the M2. It used the automotive components of the M2. And in many ways, it, it, it was restricted by the design of the M2. It would have proven far too difficult to design the large turret and tar large turret ring to fit the 75mm gun in, and they needed the tanks quite urgently. So a compromise design was made um, using parts of the M2 and having the, the offset sponson with the 75mm gun in and still retaining the 37mm gun in the turret. A very compromised design that, that was very manpower intensive but um, it was the best that could be done at the time. But it wasn't long before the Lee changed once again. In the immediate aftermath of the disaster at Dunkirk, Britain was desperately short of tanks. The British Tank Commission was keen to buy large numbers of the Lee, but only on the condition that the design was altered to suit British tank crew practice. Ideally, the British would have liked the Americans to build a brand new tank to British specifications. That wasn't possible. There just wasn't the time. So the British persuaded the Americans to adapt the Lee uh, into something called the Grant. It's, it's the same tank, but the Grant is the Lee built to certain British requirements. There were a few subtle differences between the Lee and the Grant. The Lee had a seven-man crew, whereas the Grant had a six-man crew. Instead of the Lee's Browning machine gun in the commander's cupola, the Grant had a turret-mounted smoke discharger instead. This is a tank which is, which is well received generally by its crews. Uh, and I think particularly in the Western Desert when it arrived, I mean, under Lend-Lease, they have a lot of tanks which are sent out um, to support the British in, in the Western Desert. And it's definitely a tank which is well received by its crews because the tanks up to that point they'd had in the Western Desert, many of them had been, you know, either undergunned, you know, initially, you know, mounting something like a two-pounder uh, weapon, which was totally ineffective, really, against the uh, against the Germans, or, you know, uh, they had tanks that were quite good but were, were prone to mechanical failures and breakdown. It was roomy. You could stow a great deal inside a Lee or a Grant. Um, it was rather a noisy vehicle in some ways. The uh, suspension squeaked a lot. You couldn't um, have a silent move towards, uh, towards your objective. Uh, you, noise gave you away from miles away. It was hot, of course. Um, when both guns were in action, uh, the interior tended to fog up and at the first possible opportunity you, you had to open one of the sponson doors and throw out all the empty cases, otherwise the air just wasn't breathable. And you've got this enormously tall tank, which is very, very difficult to conceal in desert conditions. And also, with the, the gun load, the main gun load down, it's not as if you can, you can fight hull down with the turret just, just protruding above the, the crest of the hill. You actually have to go right up and have your, the whole hull exposed. So it made a very, very big target. And also, it, with the big crew um, all clambering over each, uh, each other inside, again, this, this, this caused problems. But it did have the 75mm gun, which was absolutely crucial. The North African campaign begins with the Italians invading from their colony of Libya uh, into British Egypt. They then get a very bloody nose. The British trace them all the way back to Benghazi. At that point, the Germans get worried. They cannot allow their only major ally to be defeated completely in North Africa, so they reinforce. So the battle goes backwards and forwards. And in each case, uh, the, the person doing the chasing essentially goes too far runs out of petrol, runs out of track mileage, runs out of rations, and then gets pushed back again in, in turn. Rommel was uh, advancing right up towards the um, Egyptian border, and really we were not faring terribly well in, in armoured combat. Um, the German 88mm gun was still dominating the battlefield, and this was causing enormous problems. And the principal problem was the fact that these guns could not be engaged with the British two-pounder and six-pounder anti-tank guns, which simply didn't fire a high-explosive shell that could deal with, with an emplaced anti-tank gun. And really something had to be done, uh, and had to be done quite urgently. 
The Grant's baptism of fire took place on the 27th of May, 1942. Besides a number of Matilda infantry support vehicles, British forces had 167 Grants. The whole thing with the Lee and the Grant, we were actually able to denude um, US home-based tank units and fetch those tanks over. And um, so, yes, we were building quite a large stockpile of tanks um, immediately before El Alamein. The Grant, uh, you know, Lee tank was something which was very much uh, seen as a, as a good tank. It could travel at 26 miles per hour. It had a gun which could match the Panzer Mark III. Its construction using that rivet construction made it also a tank which could be easy, easy to produce. Uh, and so I think it was a very reliable tank. And certainly when it went to the Western Desert, um, after the mechanical problems it had with the Crusader tank and with some of the other cruiser tanks. Uh, and so it was regarded initially as a very effective tank and it did serve very well in the early part of the war. The British 8th Army occupied a line of defensive boxes linked by minefields running south from Gazala on the Mediterranean coast to Bir Hachaim. The Axis Army occupied parallel positions. Both armies were preparing to take the offensive, but it was the Axis who struck first. During the night of the 26th and 27th of May, two of Rommel's panzer divisions a light division and the Italian armour division began to swing round the southern flank of the British position at Bir Hachaim and drive northeast towards the coast. Although their progress was reported by South African armoured cars, this intelligence was not passed to the 4th Armoured Brigade. The disastrous result was that one of the brigade's regiments was caught deploying. All but three of the regiment's grants were lost, although 30 German tanks were knocked out in return. The brigade's two remaining regiments began slamming 75mm rounds into the enemy's tanks at a range of 1,200 metres. Shaken by the discovery, the Germans were forced to close the range to make an effective reply and suffered still further losses. Aggressive use of their anti-tank guns, however, began to sap British strength. The 4th Armoured Brigade was left with little choice but to pull back and regroup. As the battle for Gazala raged throughout the afternoon of the 27th of May, two brigades from the 1st Armoured Division entered the fray, accompanied by a regiment of Matildas. By evening, Rommel had lost a third of his tanks, and his plan was in ruins. It was a promising start for the Grant. Once the British stop Panzer Army Africa, now is the time to build up and drive them out of Africa altogether. And that's, that's what the British want to do. They cannot allow the Axis to get any closer to, to Egypt. So what we now have to do is build up, build up, build up, and then when we're ready, punch. What actually happens is that both sides build huge obstacles of minefields and wire and they sit glowering at each other. The classic example here is, is really attritional warfare. El Alamein is one of the first examples of that. The, the plan really is to, to grind down your opponent's armour using your minefields and your anti-tank weapons and only laterally using your own armour and then allowing your own armour then to go forward on the offensive. The Allies are well aware that, that the, you know, extended supply lines, that the Africa Corps and the Italians are struggling to maintain those supply lines. And, of course, the British are still holding out in Malta. And that's also very critical in terms of the supply issue, because the British are able to operate out of Malta and, and intercept uh, convoys and cause a lot of damage in terms of, you know, Rommel getting spare parts, fuel, munitions and, and other things that he needs. Over the days that followed, Rommel found himself pinned back against the British minefields. At one stage, he admitted to a captured British officer that unless supplies got through, he would have to offer terms of surrender. Although the British were poised to ambush the vulnerable German army, they just couldn't concentrate the resources to do it. But the Allies paid dearly for this lost opportunity. The Italians managed to carve a path through the minefields and supplies reached Rommel in the nick of time. 
When he was ready, he broke out into the open again, defeating the British armoured brigades one by one. On the 20th of June, Rommel took Tobruk, setting the seal on his greatest victory. But at this point, he became a victim of his own success. He made the fatal mistake of pursuing the Eighth Army, triggering a series of events that would ultimately lead to his greatest defeat. By July, the Axis army had reached the outskirts of El Alamein. But Rommel found himself in a strategic straitjacket. He lacked the fuel either to continue his advance or retreat. Both armies consolidated their positions behind deep minefields. Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery took over command and set about restoring the morale of the 8th Army. Montgomery is very important because he comes in and he's a very charismatic military leader. We get these speeches where, you know, I've seen you and you've seen me and I like you and you like me and there was all that kind of thing. And Montgomery was very good at that kind of approach, really. And in terms of him coming in, there was a definite sense, I think, that in the 8th Army that things were, were going to go much better. Montgomery imposed orthodoxy, concentration of everything, especially uh, tanks and artillery. They were going to um, fight together. He instituted a program of uh, training anybody who didn't or couldn't uh, fit in with his methods disappeared immediately uh, he went round the troops he gave not the slightest um, hint uh, that Rommel couldn't be defeated and he acted like a tonic also remember Montgomery is somebody who is not a tank man per se and so he's somebody again who believes very much in, in overwhelming firepower you know, he's not going to make a move against the Germans and against the Italians until he's sure he's got overwhelming superiority. Uh, and that's precisely what he does. He waits until he's got a minimum of a two-to-one superiority in any particular area, whether it's air power, artillery, infantry or armour. And, then, only, and then, in, then he's prepared to move forward. Uh, and, and, of course, that policy was remarkably successful. He wins at El Alamein and the, the Germans then go in like, on retreat, really, and they don't stop until they get all the way back to Tunisia. But Montgomery had another problem to deal with. Until July 1942, the Grant was easily the most powerful tank in the desert. But when Rommel had 27 Panzer IVs delivered, shockwaves rippled through the Allied ranks. On paper, the Panzer IV completely outclassed the Grant. Allied crews could only guess as to how it would perform in battle. So the Grant was demoted from Desert Predator to Egypt's last hope. Where things start to swing in the Axis favour is with the arrival of the Mark IVs and the Mark IV Specials. Now the Mark IV is a very good tank. Um, it's better than anything the British have. It's actually better than the Grant. I don't think the Grants met the uh, Mark IV Special until the Battle of Alam Halfa. It certainly caused us a great deal of surprise. Until then, the Grants had um, more or less been the dominant tank in the desert for the short period between uh, May 42 um, and August 42. From the German point of view, of course, they could never get enough of them to North Africa to really make a difference. So locally they made a difference. They won local battles, but there were never enough of them to win the campaign. <laughs> 
By the end of August, Rommel had accumulated just enough fuel for one last push to the Nile Delta. On the night of the 30th and 31st of August, he began to break through the British minefields on the southern sector of the front. But this took far longer than he'd planned, and he sustained unexpectedly heavy casualties. Once through, he started to head northeast, as he had done at Gazala. Towards evening, this brought him into contact with the 22nd Armoured Brigade, which was positioned on Alam Halfa Ridge. When the Germans turned east towards the position held by an infantry division, a clash became inevitable. When two tank regiments opened fire at close range, the German reaction was immediate. Led by their Mark IVs, their advance was so fierce that a squadron lost all 12 of its grants within a few minutes. Reinforcements were brought up to plug the gap in the Allied line. Meanwhile, the enemy continued to advance through concentrated artillery fire. They ran into a carefully concealed anti-tank gun position that knocked out several tanks at 100 meters, but did not stop. At this critical moment, with little daylight left, more Allied tanks advanced, making their presence felt at once. The German forces halted, although some of their tanks tried to work round the British flank towards the artillery. The next day, Rommel tried to pass the line of British tanks, but they could not break through. Crippled by an acute lack of fuel, and after sustained aerial bombardments, Rommel was left with little choice but to order a retreat back through the minefields, leaving behind a trail of destruction. Rommel was, uh, was a great boy scout. He was a charismatic leader of men and a very brave soldier. He didn't always pay as much attention as he should have done to administration and logistics. Now, of course, he knew he was taking a chance. Um, he reckoned that he had just enough fuel to make one go to try and get through the British defences and get to Egypt. Uh, he did try, and at Alam Halfa, of course, he, he failed. There was no other option for him other than to pull back, shorten his supply lines and go on the defensive. And if he did that, if he had shortened his supply lines and gone on the defensive, it would have handed the initiative to the Allies. And I think he knew that if that happened, the game was up. By the autumn of 1942, the Grant's successor, the Sherman, started to arrive in the desert. It eventually replaced the Grant as the 8th Army's main battle tank. At the end of October, there were 252 Shermans and 170 Grants in first-line service, plus many more in reserve. At the Second Battle of El Alamein from the 23rd to the 24th of October 1942, the Eighth Army beat the Axis. This victory turned the tide of the war in the desert, but it could so nearly have gone the other way. Alamein was the last solely British or solely British Empire battle in this war. From now on, all the campaigns are going to be allied. They're going to be with the Americans. This is our last hurrah, if you like. Uh, and it works. But it almost doesn't. When Montgomery decides to tell the armour to break out, um, he wants the armour to go through cleared lanes in the minefield against a ridge which is lined with German anti-tank guns. Uh, and the armour, understandably, is, finds that very difficult to do, and it's very slow. And Montgomery tells the armoured commanders that, that they're not doing their job, that they're not getting on, betraying, I'm afraid, a lack of understanding of what armour can do and what armour is supposed to do. He gets away with that, and it's a measure of the man that he learns very quickly how to handle armour from, from then on. But Alamein wasn't always going to be a surefire winner. There were times when it could have gone wrong. After being defeated at El Alamein, Rommel salvaged what he could from his shattered army and began the long retreat that would end in the valleys of Tunisia.
On the 8th of November, the Anglo-American First Army landed in Morocco and Algeria. Anxious to maintain its presence in North Africa, the Axis began shipping troops into Tunisia, hoping to fend off the First Army's advance from the west and Montgomery's Eighth Army from the east. Winter rains held up operations for a while, but in February 1943, the Axis Supreme Command decided that a spoiling attack should be mounted against the inexperienced First Army. Using the sword and shield tactic, the aim was to break through the Kasserine Pass and threaten the Allies' lines of communication, forcing them to withdraw into Morocco. What was known as the German sword and shield tactic was simply the integration of anti-tank guns with tanks. In very broad terms, what you did was you had a screen of anti-tank guns dug in, camouflaged. Your enemy is advancing, you halt them with your anti-tank guns, you knock off the leading tanks, everything halts, and then in comes the sword, which is your own armour, German armour, normally attacking from a flank. And that was the standard German tactic. And it took us a long time before we could do something about it. The 1st US Armoured Division, equipped mostly with Lee tanks, guarded the Kasserine Pass. Although the division was keen to get into action, it was completely inexperienced and knew little about the sword and shield tactics used by the Panzer divisions. And as repeated attempts were made to break through to American infantry marooned on three hills beyond the enemy line, increasingly savage counterattacks did nothing but add to escalating tank losses. When counterattacking along the Spitler Sidi Bouside on the 15th of February, part of the 1st Armoured Division ran into a well concealed anti tank gun screen and was then itself counterattacked on both flanks, losing 46 tanks and many other vehicles. Although the 1st Armoured Division eventually beat the Axis at Kasserine Pass, victory came at a high price. Hundreds of men lost their lives and many vehicles were destroyed. Harsh lessons were learned about the Lee Grant. Its high silhouette made it a prominent target. If one or both of its fuel tanks were penetrated, the tank would become an inferno in seconds. Events at Kasserine Pass showed the US what damage the Axis was capable of and the devastating losses hardened up what had been a weak armored division. It was a turning point for the Lee Grant, which was then promptly replaced by the Sherman as the main Allied battle tank in the Western arena. But the Lee Grant's battle career did not end there. In December 1941, the Japanese 15th Army invaded the British colony of Burma, driving its small Allied force to the Indian border. For the next four years, a bitter war raged among the most inhospitable terrain imaginable. Besides its jungle-covered mountain ranges, mangrove swamps and ramshackle roads, Burma was home to deadly insects and diseases, which claimed as many men as armed combat. Until early 1944, the Burmese campaign had mainly been fought by infantry. But after much persuasion, General Headquarters in Delhi agreed to send over tanks to help the beleaguered Allied troops. So a number of Lee tanks were dispatched to Burma. By early 44, we were starting to seriously engage the Japanese again, um, particularly in the Burma theatre. And one of the things that we desperately needed in Burma was a force multiplier along the lines of a reasonable tank. Now, the Japanese themselves, frankly, their tank design was possibly the weakest of any of the fighting powers in the Second World War. Um, and they really, they didn't field tanks to an enormous degree. So really, we didn't have to have a, a terribly up-to-date tank fighting tank. But very much like North Africa, we needed something with a decent high explosive shell that could take on in infantry and something that was very, very reliable. From now on, it is the Allies in Burma that are going to be advancing rather than the Japanese. 
the grant is useful because Japanese tanks were appalling. We criticize British tank development. Japanese are far worse, um, perfectly understandably, because the only enemy they had to worry about, or they thought they had to worry about, were the Chinese, who didn't have any tanks at all. Um, but it did mean that, of course, the, the grant was way ahead of anything the Japanese could produce. So, safe in the knowledge that they would not be faced with opponents like the German Panzer IV or Tiger tanks, Lee Cruz did not expect armoured clashes anything like those of the desert campaign. But they had underestimated the courage of Japanese tank crews, who, despite having much weaker tanks, were still determined to make life hell for the Allies. On the 20th of March, 1944, six Japanese light tanks tried to ambush a column escorted by two troops of Lees. The Japanese commander had positioned his tanks close to the left side of the track, so the Lees 75mm or 37mm guns could not be used. One Allied tank was set ablaze, but the rest roared past into a clearing where they swung round to confront their foes. After a brief but intense firefight, the Japanese made a run for it. Five were set ablaze and the sixth was knocked out. The message was clear. The Japanese did not consider the Lee as a threat. The episode provided a glimpse of things to come. The Japanese had all kinds of uh, methods of engaging tanks. Um, they could use manpower to do all kinds of things. And they would engage tanks very, very closely and, and use... Um, satchel charges, which are explosives in, a, in, in a, an ordinary bag, if you like, placed on top of a, um, a tank hatch in particular. The hatches were, were recognised as being particularly vulnerable. You had suicide squads with, with a large aircraft bomb, somebody sitting in a foxhole with a hammer, waiting for a tank to drive over the top. He would strike the fuse on the, on the bomb, and the bomb would explode and take the tank with it. So, yes, the Japanese, although they didn't have the technology and they really didn't have um, very effective anti-tank weapons, um, they made up for it in, in, in tenacity and um, a willingness to take enormous casualties. The most unutterable disgrace for the Japanese soldier was to be taken alive, even if he was wounded. He could not go home. Consequently, he fought to the last in bunkers. Everywhere he would launch suicidal attacks, one after the other, over the same ground and so on. He used every means in his power to destroy the enemy. And if a tank represented a particular threat to him, he would do everything in his power to destroy that. Despite the inferiority of Japanese tanks and anti-tank guns, Allied soldiers still faced a terrifying menace. The suicidal bravery of individual Japanese soldiers meant that men were willing to take on tanks using their wits and bare hands. So as a defense against hand-placed explosive charges, a thick wire grill was fitted above the Lee's engine deck. Another weapon the Japanese used during the Burma campaign was to smash grenades filled with cyanide gas against a tank's vision hatch to poison the crew inside. On one occasion, a sword-wielding Japanese officer even scrambled into a lee, killing the commander and 37mm gunner. It took all six rounds of the loader's revolver to finally kill him. By 1944, Japanese anti-tank strategies and weapons had reached another, more sinister level. The end of the Burma campaign saw the appearance of the anti-tank equivalent of the kamikaze, the Nokohaku Kogegi, otherwise known as human combat tank destruction squads. These volunteers would suddenly break cover and throw themselves under a tank, where they would detonate the explosive charge strapped to their bodies. This need for extra vigilance triggered the formation of specialist infantry support units who were trained to repel such attacks. We had now become quite used to these suicidal tactics they employed, and we had trained a regiment um, called the Bombay Grenadiers uh, in close support for tank. Nine times out of ten, they shot these guys when they, emer when they emerged from cover. Um, 
it was a very dangerous job being um, a close escort, but, but they were good at it. Um, and uh, again, tank crews got used to it themselves. Uh, those occasions I've known where they've simply reversed off the man who was thrown, them, and he's blown himself up you know, in front of them and so on. They, do, they were desperate measures and they didn't work. There are many cases, you know, where you have mass infantry assaults against, uh, against armour, and, and there's only going to be one result in that, and that's going to be mass casualties for the Japanese. So this is an important tank. It has a very important psychological effect, I think, on the Japanese, and it has a, a critical role in the, in the battle around Imphal and the drive south through Malaysia. So all in all, you know, the Grant tank, which had performed well in the Western Desert, also has a critical role out here in the Far East in the latter part of World War II. The Japanese were experts in constructing bunkers, which were concealed with vegetation and connected by underground galleries. But once detected, no bunker complex was safe from the lee. The vegetation was blasted off with high explosive until a fire slit was revealed. Whenever possible, a smoke round was put into the slit. Seeping along the galleries, the smoke would reveal more and more fire slits. The timbers would then be smashed up with more armor-piercing shot until the roof collapsed. If necessary, stubborn bunkers would be blasted apart with high explosive. In February 1944, the Lee played a vital part in the defense of the 7th Indian Division's admin box in northern Burma after it was attacked by the Japanese 55th Division. The tank's tremendous firepower smashed up the enemy's attacks destroyed its bunkers and provided defensive shoots at night. In one notorious incident, the Japanese captured the main dressing station, slaughtering patients and orderlies alike. After this atrocity, neither British nor Indian troops were willing to show the Japanese any mercy. Now, the admin box was basically 1,200 yards, or about 1,000 metres, of open paddy fields that were surrounded by jungle. And so what we have there is this, is this very brutal battle of the admin box with dug-in British troops from the 7th Indian Division, but supported by the Grant tank. And the Japanese really had no answer to this. Uh, and the tank and its firepower were very critical in that battle of the admin box and really actually uh, saved Britain's military reputation in this battle in, in, in part because... Um, the British forces had been surprised. They hadn't expected the Japanese to show up uh, and, and be prepared to assault what was their supply centre and administrative centre. And so the, the, the fighting around this area was incredibly ferocious. Uh, but the, the tank really had a, a, you know, had, a, had a major impact in terms of this. In March 1944, the Japanese launched Operation Yugo, an attack on the eastern Indian region of Assam. The aim was to inspire the Indian people to revolt against their British rulers and so divert American forces from the war in the Pacific. The British 4th Corps found itself besieged by the Japanese 15th Army on the Imphal Plain, as was the small garrison at Kohima, lying on the main route back to India. At Imphal, the Lees helped to recapture the towering peak of Nunshigum, which dominated the main airfield, and also flushed out the Japanese from surrounding villages. On the 18th of April, the Lees of the British 33rd Corps relieved Kohima and then fought their way south to relieve four corps at Imphal on the 22nd of June. The Allies captured Mandalay on the 20th of March 1945 after a diversionary attack was mounted at the vital enemy communications centre of Maktila. Starved of supplies and ammunition, the Japanese divisions holding the Irrawaddy line simply disintegrated. This triggered what became known as the Race for Rangoon, in which four corps travelled down the Maikatila to Rangoon railway corridor, while 33 corps followed the more difficult line of the Irrawaddy. Rangoon was rapidly abandoned by the enemy, and the war in Burma was over. In Burma, it really came into its own. It could have been designed for uh, uh, war in a semi-jungle environment, uh, and uh, I cannot think of a tank which could have performed better in those circumstances.
Uh, later it played a useful role in a variety of tasks, special purpose vehicles and, and that sort of thing. So it was a success story within the limitations of the period in which it served. As a tank, it worked extremely well in, in, in this terrain. It certainly surprised the Japanese. The Japanese really had no effective answer to this uh, 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 deployment of this tank. Uh, and as I say, their own tank design was, was not going to be sufficient to actually challenge the, the M3 grant uh, at all, really, in Malaysia. The Lee grant was only ever meant to be a stopgap. Yet it enjoyed a wartime career that stretched from the Sahara to the jungles of Burma. Although it was overshadowed in the West by the arrival of the M4 Sherman, it proved perfectly suited to Burma's treacherous terrain and climate. Its reliability and speed earned it the respect of crews and the fear of opponents. And until 1945, it was America's answer to the Axis menace.